Thank you for joining us today here at Levittown Public Libraries, Unsung Heroes of the Civil Rights Movement with Dr. William Thierfelder. Uh, it is Wednesday, February 8th, around 2 p.m. Go ahead, Dr. Thierfelder. Well, thank you very much and uh, welcome to the Levittown Public Libraries presentation. Um, as you just heard, my name is Dr. William Thierfelder. I often go by Bill and I will be your host today. For those who don't know me, I'm a retired professor of arts and humanities. I currently live in Portland, Oregon, where I'm a lecturer, writer, and artist. I also make it back annually to my hometown of New York City to continue my work as a docent and a fossil explainer at the American Museum of Natural History. Now, because we can't fit everything into a 60 or so minute presentation, I invite you to take a deeper dive into today's topic at my website, which is makingwings.net. Uh, and you can see that on the bottom of your screen, makingwings.net. And it's gonna be deeper dive number 46. Now, what do I mean by that? Let me show you. So makingwings.net. So if you do that, you're going to be brought to a home page. There's a menu, what's called a hamburger menu in the upper right corner. If you click on that, you're going to see all kinds of choices that you can make. You can even be nosy and read my resume if you want. But you're going to see in the middle a very large bunch of these deeper dives. For every one of the presentations that I give at libraries, I also create a corresponding page on this website. And in this case, it is number 46. So just click on the Chevron next to 41 to 50. And there you see 46 unsung civil rights heroes here. And what you're going to get then is a whole bunch of web resources, uh, an overview that includes uh, some videos, uh, some recommended media. Now we're going to talk about these books and DVDs in a moment. And um, I have a whole bunch of uh, unsung heroes here, including the six people that we are going to be talking about specifically today. So there's all kinds of material, as you can see, um, short videos, longer videos, biographies. And all you have to do, let's just pick this one, for example, on Bayard Rustin. You click on that and you will be brought to a biography. And when you're done with it, all you have to do is click it off and you're brought back to my website. So uh, please uh, take advantage of this. There's all kinds of goodies uh, that I have put on there for you. Now, as I said, as you saw on my website, I have a section devoted to recommended media. Now, here are some of the titles I think you might find helpful. And again, uh, you can copy down these titles by going to my website. There's uh, Lynn Olson's Freedom's Daughters, which includes unsung women fighting for equality as far back as the mid 19th century. John D'Amelio's Lost Prophet gives a very fair overview of the life of an often complicated man trying to live his truth, not only as a black person, but as a gay man. Ella Baker and uh, the Black Freedom Movement by uh, Barbara Ransby uh, gives us a really gripping portrait of a woman who had a truly radical vision for what a democracy could and should be. Now, Emmett Till's story has achieved nearly legendary status as a recent film about his life illustrates. And that status is due in great part to the tireless efforts of uh, his mother, Mamie Till Mobley. Her book, Death of Innocence, is eye-opening and provocative in the best sense of the word. Rosalind Rosenberg's biography of Pauli Murray called Jane Crow is a remarkable portrait of an advocate who was both a lawyer and later in life, a remarkably effective Episcopalian priest. 
I also recommend Sandra Washington's The Story of uh, Nanny Helen Burroughs. Uh, it's a short biography intended for school age readers, but it's equally informative for adult readers. One of the most important titles um, in um, uh, it, that is on my list is uh, uh, Philip uh, Hoose's, H-O-O-S-E, Hoose's biography of Claude at Colvin uh, called Twice Toward Justice. Um, it's a really a wonderful story about a woman whose story was marginalized for decades, even within her own community. And we're actually going to be talking about that marginalization a little bit later. Um, one last recommendation uh, is a film called Brother Outsider. It gives a very fair-minded look at Bayard Rustin, the man behind much of Dr. Martin Luther King's success. Indeed, as we will see later in this program, it's quite possible that without Rustin, we would not have King. So with all of that said, let's begin. The first of our unsung heroes is the remarkable Nanny Helen Burroughs, who created the National Training School for Women and Girls in Washington, D.C. in 1909. Uh, Nanny was born on uh, May the 2nd of 1879 in Orange, Virginia. Her father, John, was a Baptist minister who died when Nanny was a child. Because of the resulting family hardship, Nanny's mother, Jeannie, moved Nanny to her aunt's home in Washington, D.C. in 1883. During the 1880s, Nanny, Nanny uh, attended the Charles Sumner School on the corner of M Street and 17th Street Northwest. It, now, you can see the school then and now on your screen, uh, then on the left side and now on the right side. Uh, at Sumner, uh, she quickly became an honor student. Outside the classroom, she formed a, a literary club, studied business, and what was then called domestic science. Now, in my day, we called it home economics. <laughs> in other words, she was being trained to be a good stay-at-home wife, despite her exceptional skills in many areas. And again, there's nothing wrong with being a stay-at-home wife. He was a person who was really brilliant in many ways and probably wanted to aim in a different direction. But ultimately, Nanny decided against marriage and chose to devote her entire life to the church and to the education of Black women. Between 1898 and 1909, she served as editorial secretary and bookkeeper for the Foreign Mission Board of the National Baptist Convention. And it was while she was on that board in 1900 that she delivered a speech uh, that put her on the map and raised her profile nationally. Uh, for everyone who um, just came in, um, again, could you please refrain from putting things in the chat, send it to public relations. Otherwise it pops up on my screen and it covers what I'm reading at the bottom of the screen. Thank you very much. Well, when she was speaking at that 1900 um, convention, she really made a splash. It was called How the Sisters Are Hindered from Helping. And let me go to the next page here. Yes, okay. Now, here's an excerpt from that address. And uh, you can follow along if you would like. We women come not to usurp thrones, nor to sow discord, but to so organize the work that each church may help through a women's missionary society. It is for the utilization of talent and the stimulation of Christian activity that we are promoted to service. 
We realize that allowing these gems to lie unpolished any longer means a loss to the denomination. For a number of years, there has been a righteous discontent, a burning zeal to go forward in his name among Baptist women of our churches. And it will be the dynamic force in the religious campaign at the opening of the 20th century. We realize too, uh, that the work is too great and the labor is too few for us women to stand by. Well, we come now to the rescue. We unfurl our banner upon which is inscribed, woman arise, he calleth for thee. Will you as a pastor and friend of missions help the cause by not hindering these women when they come among you to speak and to enlist the women of your church? So it has been from the time of Miriam, that most remarkable woman, the sister of Moses, right on down to courageous women who in very recent years have carried the gospel into Tibet and Africa. They have proclaimed and taught the truth where no man has been allowed to enter. Surely women have had a very important part in the work of saving this redeemed earth. Well, these are very powerful, very trailblazing words coming from a black woman in 1900. Well, her fervor was rewarded. At that same convention in 1900, Nanny uh, became the co-founder of the Women's Convention of the National Baptist Convention and served as its president in many other capacities from 1900 until 1947. But it was in the first decade of the 20th century that one of Burroughs' greatest accomplishments was achieved, the founding in 1909 of the National Training School for Women and Girls in Washington, D.C. This famous institution was renamed in 1964 as the Nanny Helen Burroughs School. And its campus on 50th Street Northeast is a bit of a pilgrimage site for people interested in civil rights. Eventually, the school became a co-educational institution focusing on young people from pre-K through sixth grade. Today, the 1971 building seen on the, the left of your screens up there, see the upper left, um, houses the Monroe School, a co-ed junior high school. Nearby, the oldest of the buildings, which housed the original school, is on the National Registry. Um, you can see in the upper right there, uh, girls sitting on the front steps back in 1909 on that uh, very famous building. Now, of all its many incarnations, this remarkable school keeps a sharp focus. Proper work ethics, community action, and moral respectability. Nanny remained active in the school until her death in 1961. Meanwhile, okay, let's do this. Okay. Meanwhile, uh, during the 1910s and well into her later life, Burroughs was an important member of the National Association of Colored Women, which was founded in 1896. Further, she co-founded the National Association of Wage Earners, which sought equity in pay for African-American women. Simply put, her life completely was completely devoted to these many different causes. <laughs> but in addition, to all of her other activities, she also wrote plays, most of them during the 1920s. One of them, the Slabtown District Convention, is still widely performed today. Uh, the picture on your screen is from a recent performance at the Creative and Performing Arts Center in Woodbridge, Virginia. In 1931, President Herbert Hoover appointed Nanny as chair of the White House Conference for Home Building and Ownership, a precursor 
to department to the Department of Housing and Urban Development and organizations like Habitat for Humility uh, for Humanity yeah for Humility too right Habitat for Humanity. I love the photo of Nanny on your left. Oh, she's clearly a passionate person. During the 1940s and 50s, she continued to advocate for fair housing, equal pay, and education opportunities uh, for uh, African Americans. Uh, after a very long life, vigorous life, Nanny Burroughs passed away at 82 years young on May 20th of 1961. Today, the Library of Congress now houses over 110,000 of her papers, including letters and manuscripts. It's an extraordinary legacy from an extraordinary woman. Now, the second of our six heroes is Ella Baker. One of the guiding lights behind an important early civil rights organization called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, also known as SNCC. Baker was born on December the 13th of 1903 in Norfolk, Virginia, where her father, Blake, worked for several steamship lines as a longshoreman and a porter. In 1910, Norfolk had a race riot in which whites attacked black workers from the shipyard. And as a result, her mother, Georgiana, decided to take Ella and her brother and sister to Littleton, North Carolina to live with her maternal grandparents while her father continued to work for the steamship company. Now, as a child, like Nanny Burroughs, Baker proved to be a superb student. So much so that in 1918, with her family's support, she enrolled in the high school academy, which was a preparatory school that served as a feeder to Shaw University, one of the great historically black colleges and universities in America. After graduating uh, from the prep school with honors, um, she went on to Shaw and graduated in 1927 as its valedictorian. And you can see in the background uh, pictures of Shaw University. A couple of years later, in 1929, Ella moved to New York City, where she worked in editorial positions at American West Indian News and Negro National News. The following year, 1930, Baker became the national director of the Young Negroes Cooperative League, the YNCL. This outstanding organization operated 24 consumer cooperatives and consumer buying clubs around the country, promoting not only racial equality, but gender equality as well. Her organization's motto was an affirmation, uh, which you see on your screen in, in yellow. We accept with zest. I like that with zest, the opportunity which is now ours to prove to ourselves that the Negro can and will save himself from economic death. What a powerful statement for any time period, but that was trailblazing in 1930. Meanwhile, during this time, Baker lived with and married her college sweetheart, uh, T.J. Roberts. Um, his nickname was Bob. Uh, they probably married in 1938. Don't have the birth certificate, uh, not the birth certificate, the marriage certificate. But they divorced in 1958 after leading very separate lives. Baker rarely discussed her private life or marital status. According to fellow activist Bernice Johnson Reagan, uh, many women in the civil rights uh, movement followed Baker's example, adopting a practice of a dissemblance about their private lives that allowed them to be accepted as individuals, especially by the men in the movement. From 1938 to 1953, <clears throat> her chief focus was the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. 
She was uh, named director of branches in 1943 and then president of the New York City branch in 1952, where she focused most uh, of her energies on fighting school segregation and police brutality. In 1953, trying to bring some of the chief issues of the movement to light, Baker ran for New York City Council on the liberal ticket, but she lost. New York simply wasn't ready for an African-American and certainly not an African-American woman in a position of authority. In 1956, she became a co-founder of In Friendship with Stanley Levinson and Bayard Rustin. Now the group assisted many different grassroots organizations financially. She remained with In Friendship until 1959 when the organization disbanded. And around that same time, Baker became deeply involved with the newly formed Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the SCLC. Baker quickly became the organization's director from 1958 to 1960, organizing various events, including prayer, uh, prayer pilgrimages and voter registration campaigns. I love this picture of her there in your upper right, very passionate person. But it was as the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, known as SNCC, it was that organization that put Ella on the map. From 1960 until 1966, Baker was one of the chief engines that drove the organization. She founded SNCC at her alma mater, Shaw University. It promoted the now famous sit-ins that were seen across the country and was a chief proponent of voter registration primarily in the South. It was in her role as uh, the head of, as a leader of SNCC, the head of SNCC, that the then 60-year-old Baker uh, gained the nickname Fundy, uh, a word from Swahili that means a person who teaches a craft. Now, I love this quote, sadly, <laughs> seems uh, as true today as it did when she uttered these words in 1964. Until the killing of black men, black mother's sons, becomes as important to the rest of the country as the killing of a white mother's son, we who believe in freedom cannot rest until this happens. Well, from 1962 to 1967, Baker was also a driving force uh, behind the SCEF, the Southern Conference Education Fund. She preached social justice, desegregation, and above all, human rights. Uh, the photo in the center uh, of your screen shows her determination. A recurring message came through loud and clear. That's a message you see on your screen. Baker believed that socialism was a humane alternative to capitalism. What she supported was socialism. She had little time for communism, especially as it was unfolding in China and the Soviet Union. Finally, uh, during the 1970s and 80s, uh, when she herself was in her 70s and 80s, she remained an active socialist and an active social activist. One of her special projects was the controversial Free Angela Davis campaign, whom you see in the upper left as she looks today. Baker became an important voice for that cause. Now, to refresh your memories, you may recall that Angela Davis, who was a member of the Communist Party until 1991, had purchased rifles for her personal security guards. Unfortunately, those guards used them in a 1970 courtroom shooting in Marin County, California. She was prosecuted for three capital felonies, including conspiracy to murder, and was held in jail for over a year before being acquitted of all the charges in 1972. David, uh, Davis, who was now in her early 80s, remains a powerful and controversial figure in American history. 
and was included in Time's 100 Most Influential People of 2020 because of her involvement in the Black Lives Matter movement. Meanwhile, in the early 1980s, <clears throat> Uh, Baker spoke out for Puerto Rican independence and became a crusader to end apartheid in South Africa. Sadly, she didn't live to see the end of apartheid. Baker died on her 83rd birthday, December 13th of 1986. Now talk about the circle of life, right? To be born and to die on the same day. We next honor one of the most remarkable women of the movement, Polly Murray, who was a prominent civil rights lawyer, a co-founder of the National Organization for Women, and in her later life, became the first African-American woman ordained as an Episcopalian priest. Uh, this was all capped in 2012, when the Episcopal Church of America canonized her as a saint. Now, as a quick uh, side note, saints in the Episcopal Church serve a different purpose than they do in the Catholic Church, where they are intercessors on behalf of Catholics praying to them. No, uh, in the Episcopal Church, the selected individuals are seen as exemplary members of the church's communion of saints, of which everyone is a part. Church members call these saints to mind as a source of ongoing inspiration. So Pauli Murray's feast day is July the 1st, the date of her death in 1985. Murray was born in Baltimore, uh, Maryland on November the 20th of 1910. After her mother died in 1914, she moved to Durham, North Carolina to live with her aunt because her father, William, simply couldn't raise six children on his own. You see, Murray's father began to have emotional problems as a result of typhoid fever, so relatives took custody of, her children, of his children. And eventually, William was committed to a psychiatric institution where he received less than meaningful treatment. Uh, in 1923, William who had been committed to the hospital for the Negro insane in Maryland, died as a result of being beaten to death by a white guard. Murray had hoped to rescue him when she reached legal age, but sadly, she was only 13 when he died. In 1926, Pauli graduated from high school at the head of her class and then went to New York City so she could meet the entrance requirements for Hunter College. Now, to do that, she needed a New York State diploma, so she received a second high school diploma from Richmond Hills High School in New York in 1927. She made it into Hunter, and while there, she secretly married Billy Wynn on November the 30th, 1930. It was a decision she would soon come to regret. Murray and Wynn only spent a few months together before separating. In fact, they didn't see one another again before Murray contacted him uh, to have their marriage annulled in 1949. Now, there's always been uh, much speculation about, oh, there she is. Yes, a good picture of her. Now, there's always been uh, much speculation about uh, Murray's sexuality. Although acknowledging the term homosexual in describing others, Murray preferred to describe herself as having a quote unquote, inverted sex instinct that caused her to behave like a man who was attracted to women. She wanted a monogamous married life, but one in which she was the man. In all likelihood today, she would probably call herself transgender, a label that some in the LGBTQ community have used to describe her. Now, I bring up her gender and orientation uh, only because they have an impact several times on her career and on her work in civil rights. Meanwhile, in the period after the disintegration of her marriage, um, 
the 22-year-old Murray graduated from Hunter College uh, in 1933 and went on to work for uh, President uh, Roosevelt's WPA, the Works Project Administration, uh, then for the Workers' Defense League, and finally as a teacher in the New York City Remedial Reading Project. And there you see Hunter College down there. Uh, but Murray wanted more. She wanted to move on into a career uh, that might have a potentially greater impact. And for that, she needed a, high, uh, a graduate degree. But Murray was rejected from graduate school at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill because she was Black. She decided with the help and support of the NAACP to challenge what she clearly saw as a racist policy. However, in the end, the NAACP decided not to pursue the case because of her New York resident status, meaning that a Northern woman fighting the cause in a Southern state would ultimately be a losing proposition. During this upheaval in her life, uh, Murray uh, focused her energy on civil rights causes. And in 1940, she ended up being arrested and jailed for protesting the Virginia law requiring segregation on buses. That experience ex inspired her. Seeing the legal profession as a possible way to move equality issues forward, Murray decided to enter law school, which she did in 1941, when she was accepted into the Howard University Law School. But even there, in a historically Black university, Murray encountered overt sex discrimination from faculty and students, partly because she was a woman in a nearly all male profession, but partly because she was perceived to be quote unquote different and quote unquote unfeminine. Yet she didn't let her personal troubles uh, get in the way of her advocacy for equal rights. And she actively participated in restaurant sit-ins in an attempt to desegregate public facilities and Black communities in Washington, D.C., and other areas of that region. Well, though she always had a passion for civil rights issues, probably rooted in her childhood memories of her grandmother telling her stories of lynchings and other horrors, Murray's civil rights activism was firmly rooted in the 1942 execution of Odell Waller, whom you see on your left, Waller was executed for shooting his white landlord, and Murray joined Eleanor Roosevelt and others to protest that execution. Her experiences uh, surrounding that case led to her publishing Negroes Are Fed Up in Common Sense magazine in 1943. It was a progressive journal headquartered in New York City. She also penned a major article about the 1943 Harlem race riots in the socialist newspaper, New York Call, and published her famous poem on race relations, Dark Testament, in the winter issue of uh, South Today. And we'll talk about that poem um, a little more in just a couple of minutes. In June of 1944, Murray graduated from Howard Law School, first in her class, and the only woman. Excited by future prospects in law, she applied for admission to the Harvard Law School for advanced studies, only to be rejected. This time, not because she was Black, but because of her gender, despite President Roosevelt supporting her. Yes, because she was a woman. Okay. Undaunted, she enrolled in the University of California's uh, Law School at Berkeley. She was accepted without question, and she graduated with honors from there in 1945, once again as one of the few women in the country to obtain a law degree. Very much like a Ruth Bader Ginsburg, by the way, with whom she was friends. Now, after her graduation, she served as 
the deputy attorney general in California and by 1947 was named woman of the year by the National Council of Negro Women and was a merit award winner for Mademoiselle magazine. Now, a key moment in her law career happened in 1951 when she was asked by the Methodist Church to author a document about the laws in various states regarding race and color. The result of that uh, invitation was a seminal essay on race in America called States Laws on Race and Color. That document has often been called the Bible for one of the most famous anti-segregation decisions by the Supreme Court, the transformative 1954 case Brown versus Board of Education, in which the justices unanimously ruled that racial segregation in schools was unconstitutional. Now, despite all of this legal brilliance, Murray still ended up being rejected in 1952 by Cornell University for a teaching position. Why? Huh, this is an interesting one because several members of the admissions committee felt that the people who had supplied her references, so this has nothing to do with color or with her being a woman, they had a dispute with the references, which included former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, the NAACP's Chief Counsel Thurgood Marshall, and civil rights leader A. Philip Randolph. They were all considered too radical. So th there's the first one. We're not we're not barring you because of your your uh, your race or your gender. We just don't like your uh, your references. <laughs> wow, <laughs> the excuses, right? Yet Murray kept plugging along in her legal career and kept writing as well. In 1956, she published her seminal work, Proud Shoes: The Story of an American Family, which is a biography of her grandparents and their struggles with racial prejudice. Her work was rewarded on a national level in 1961 when uh, President uh, John F. Kennedy appointed Murray to the President's Commission on the Status of Women with a special focus on civil and political rights. Three years later, uh, when Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Murray co-authored with fellow activist Mary Eastwood an article in the George Washington Law Review called Jane Crow and the Law, Sex Discrimination and Title VII. Now, you may recall that Title VII of the Civil Rights Act addresses equal employment opportunities. In this important essay, Murray drew parallels between sex-based discrimination and the discrimination inherited, inherent in Jim Crow laws. Uh, those laws were, uh, just to refresh our memory, uh, were state and local laws that enforced racial segregation through much of the South. All of them were act, enacted in the late 19th and early 20th century by white dominated state legislatures and were enforced often vigorously until 1965. Now, of course, uh, one could argue that those laws, while technically no longer on the books, are still being tacitly employed in some places in our country, which is a major point made by current civil rights leaders. Well, meanwhile, in 1965, Murray received her Juris Doctor from Yale, becoming the first African American to receive this degree from Yale. Her dissertation called The Roots of the racial crisis prologue to policy um, is still considered a very trailblazing document. And that same year, uh, she served as counsel in White versus Crook, an Alabama case that successfully challenged the use of sex and race discrimination in jury selection in that state. So you can see that she dove into the law and she made a mark. A year after uh, receiving her doctorate, Murray, along with Betty Friedan and 30 others, including Ruth Bader Ginsburg, founded the National Organization for Women, NOW, <clears throat> which began to turn the tide of sexism in America. 
still have a long way to go, don't we? But it was the beginning, right? Of course, the, the biggest area that I think we still see is, you know, pay equality, but without people like Murray and the now organization, things would be decidedly worse. So good, for, good on them, right? Then from 68 to 73, Murray was a highly regarded professor of law and politics at Brandeis University. And it was during this period in 1970 that she published her sole book of poetry called Dark Testament. The title poem was the same one she had published in the 1940s. Now, here's a portion of that poem, and you can follow along if you'd like. Hope is a crushed stalk between clenched fingers. Hope is a bird's wing broken by a stone. Hope is a word in a tuneless ditty, a word whispered without, excuse me, with the wind, a dream of 40 acres and a mule a cabin of one's own and a moment to rest, a name and place for one's children and children's children at last. Hope is a song in a weary throat. Oh, give me a song of hope and a world where I can sing it. Give me a song of faith and a people to believe in it. Give me a song of kindliness and a country where I can live it. Give me a song of hope and love and a brown girl's heart to hear it. I think we can agree that that's a very moving piece. And as always, uh, 80 years old and still relevant. And then comes 1973. At the age of 62, she resigned from Brandeis University and entered the General Theological Seminary in New York one year prior to the Episcopal Church's approval of women as candidates for ordination. So even there, she was a trailblazer, right? Think of that. Without knowing whether she would ever be allowed into the priesthood, she still attended the seminary. Once the church in 1974 approved a female priesthood, she applied her coursework towards the priest formation program and Murray graduated with honors. In 1977, Pauli Murray became the first African-American female priest ordained into the Episcopal church. But, her active priesthood only lasted five years because Episcopalian church law required retirement at age 72. And so Murray had to retire in 1982. Yet once a priest, always a priest. So Murray continued to serve as a chaplain for hospitalized and homebound people in Alexandria, Virginia, as well as a visiting priest in a local Baltimore church. Sadly, Murray died of pancreatic cancer in 1985, just a few months shy of her 75th birthday. In the Episcopal faith, her death date, July 1st, is considered the date she entered into the heavenly communion of saints. That's why her feast day as St. Pauli Murray has been celebrated on July 1st, every year since she was elevated to sainthood in 2012. Next up is Bayard Rustin, who was one of the principal movers and shakers behind the famous 1963 March on Washington, one of the seminal events of the civil rights movement. Yet, like Pauli Murray, his sexual orientation often proved a stumbling block, as we shall see. Bayard Rustin uh, was born on March the 17th, uh, of 1912 in Westchester, Pennsylvania. He had been raised to believe that his parents were Julia and Jennifer Rustin, when in fact they were his grandparents. Uh, he discovered uh, this truth before his adolescence, that the woman he thought was his sibling, Florence, 
was in fact his mother, who'd had Rustin with a West Indian immigrant named Archie, uh, Archie Hopkins. His grandparents were relatively wealthy local caterers who raised Rustin in a large house. Uh, Grandma Julia was a Quaker, and although she was a Quaker, she did attend her husband's African Methodist Episcopal Church. She was also a member of the NAACP. In fact, NAACP leaders such as W.E.B. Du Bois and James Weldon Johnson were frequent guests in the Rustin home. Well, with these influences in his early life, is it any wonder that in his youth, Rustin campaigned against racially discriminatory Jim Crow laws? During the 1920s, uh, Rustin wrote poetry, played football, and also discovered his homosexuality, something that would haunt much of his professional and personal life. From 1932 until 36, he attended Wilberforce University, a historically black school in Ohio, and then Cheyenne Teachers College, another historically black school in Pennsylvania. In both places, he was on music scholarships. Why? Primarily because he was a very accomplished tenor. Now, after what may have been some scandalous behavior at Wilberforce and Cheyenne, Cheyenne excuse me, Cheney, like saying Cheyenne, it's Cheney, uh, he never tried to hide his homosexuality. So Rustin decided, I'm going to move to Harlem. And he did that in 1937, where he attended City College. Now, while there, living in the aura of the so-called Harlem Renaissance, he sang with the renowned Josh White Quartet, and in 1939, he performed with the great Paul Robeson in a Broadway show, John Henry. Now, during this period from 1938 to 1941, Rustin was a member of the Young Communist League. He quit, however, when the League ordered him to stop protesting racial segregation in the armed forces. But the damage was done. Both his membership in the party and his support of desegregation immediately put him on the FBR radar and on J. Edgar Hoover's infamous watch list. In the same year that he resigned from the Communist League, 1941, Rustin worked with A. Philip Randolph, the president of the Railroad Porters Union, to organize the March on Washington movement. Now, the march was meant to protest both segregation in the armed forces and the exclusion of Blacks from working in the defense industry. In the end, the march was canceled after President Roosevelt, under strong pressure, signed Executive Order 8802, see that on the right, uh, which created the Fair Employment Practices Committee, an early attempt at affirmative action. The following year, uh, in 1942, Rustin helped create CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, with Bernice Fisher, James L. Farmer, and others. Today, CORE continues its work as a philanthropic human rights organization. Now, enraged by what he saw as another grave injustice, in 1944, Rustin went to California to protect the property of tens of thousands of Japanese American citizens who had been put in internment camps by the Roosevelt administration. You see, wherever he saw injustice, Rustin actively fought against it. In, in that same year of 1944, Rustin found himself incarcerated in a high security prison in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, where he remained for 26 months. Why? Because he'd failed to appear before his draft board and citing his Quaker background for refusing alternative service as a conscientious objector. Now, beyond this, his open homosexuality at a time when his orientation was considered a crime and his desegregation programs also deeply bothered authorities, and they were glad to see him locked away. But not losing a beat after he was released, 
he participated in Core's 1947 Journey of Reconciliation to test the Supreme Court's Morgan v. Virginia ruling, which desegregated interstate travel. Well, once again, he found himself arrested. And what was the reason this time? Ah, talk about little nitty picky things here. Here, listen to this. The, <laughs> he had gotten off and on the core bus within the state of North Carolina. And North Carolina argued that the Supreme Court's ruling only applied to interstate travel, not to travel within a state. So he had broken a state law by getting on and off the bus. And the Supreme Court's ruling couldn't be applied. After a period of appeals, he was put on a chain gang in North Carolina for several months in 1949. In the end, Rustin would end up being arrested 23 times over his career. In 1948, during the appeals process for that North Carolina case, he traveled as a representative of CORE's Fellowship of Reconciliation to India to study Gandhi's pacifism. Gandhi had been assassinated in January of 48, and Rustin wanted to pursue his interest in nonviolence and Eastern philosophies. Now, as we'll see in a moment, uh, that trip to India would later prove important when he became a very close advisor to Martin Luther King. And you see in the photo here, uh, he uh, is there uh, talking with uh, Prime Minister Nehru. Now, a painfully defining moment in Rustin's life occurred in 1953, a moment that would haunt him, a moment that would uh, put him behind the scenes of the civil rights movement rather than in the forefront. He was arrested in Pasadena for lewd conduct. The charge, it seems that he and two white male friends had engaged in sexual activity in an automobile. Now, he would say later on, rather sardonically, that such, <clears throat> quote unquote, activity was, quote, apparently okay for boys and girls, but not for boys and boys, unquote. Though Rustin became far more discreet afterwards, the arrest created difficulties for the Black leadership from then on. So when Rustin joined Dr. King, to support the Montgomery bus boycott in 1956, and when he taught King about Gandhi, and when he helped organize the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, his sexual orientation was always looming in the background. Now, more of that in just a moment. Rustin's striving for human justice and humanitarian causes expanded even further in 1957 when he actively protested France's nuclear testing program in the Algerian desert. You see, he wasn't just focused on America. Wherever and whenever he saw a cause, he became proactive. But back at home, things got very ugly when in 1960, the congressional representative for Harlem, Adam Clayton Powell, you can see him in the upper uh, right corner there, when Adam Clayton Powell, who knew about Rustin's sexual orientation, threatened to say that Reverend King and Rustin were lovers if the Southern Christian Leadership Conference marched outside the Democratic Convention in Los Angeles. Well, King called off the march, and then, in an act that some found cowardly, even if it was politically the right move, he created a great distance between himself and Rustin. Well, Rustin handled that all with grace. And uh, however, reluctantly, he even resigned from the, Sus uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Yet, many people in the movement, including eventually Dr. King, kept in touch with Rustin behind the scenes. In 1963, to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, a. Philip Randolph started organizing the March on Washington, just as he had in 1941. And just as he had in 1941, he put Rustin in a prominent role. That is, 
until other black leaders, including Roy Wilkins, said that Rustin was a liability because he was gay and a former communist. As a compromise, Rustin was allowed to remain a prime force behind the march as long as he agreed to remain as inconspicuous as possible. He agreed to doing this because he believed in the message despite the systematic ostr ostracism. So I believe in our message. Yes, you may ostracize me, but I believe in the message enough that I'll still keep active and yes, I'll be very discreet. I'll stay in the next room. I won't stay with you in the room. Well, as a result and as a result uh, as a reward, he was allowed to speak briefly but powerfully at the march as seen in the picture on your screen. I just put a little yellow arrow there. There's Rustin speaking at the march on Washington. By the late 1960s, his moderate stands on the Vietnam War and other issues made him a traitor to some within the black militant community. As he became more and more tired of the complaints and bigotry, his focus became more and more international. In fact, during this time, he became the vice chair of the International Rescue Committee, um, a global humanitarian aid relief organization uh, uh, that uh, is still active today. It was founded in 1933 at the request of Albert Einstein. The IRC, as they say, is still uh, active. It provides emergency aid and long-term assistance to refugees and those displaced by war, persecution, or natural disaster, such as the one, quite sadly, we have just had in Turkey and in Syria. And then, we got to have a happy note here, right? In 1977, at the tender age of 65, Rustin met Walter Nagel a white civil rights proponent, educator, and photographer who was three decades younger than Rustin. Yet despite the June-January age difference, the two men remained committed life partners until Rustin's death. In fact, Rustin adopted Nagel since marriage was not an option. This allowed Nagel to inherit Rustin's home and belongings, as well as Rustin's extensive papers. Today, Nagel continues as executive director of the Bayard Rustin Fund. Meanwhile, during the 1970s and 80s, Rustin continued activist work, devoting his life to education, gay rights, marriage equality, Soviet Jews, and Israel. He also became fiercely anti-communist in later years, despising what he saw in China and the Soviet Union. After years of tireless work, Rustin passed away on August the 24th of 1987 from a perforated appendix. An obituary in the New York Times said this, quote, looking back at his career, Mr. Rustin, a Quaker, once wrote, the principal factors which influence my life are one, nonviolent tactics, two, constitutional means, three, democratic procedures, four, respect for human personality, and five, a belief that all people are one. As a beautiful coda to Rustin's life, in August of 2013, on the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, Barack Obama bestowed a posthumous presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor on Bayard Rustin and Walter Nagel accepted that award. Well, now we move to one of the most tragic events of the civil rights era, the murder of Emmett Till. Our next hero is Emmett's mother, Mamie Till Mobley, who became an educator and a wonderful public speaker. Born Mamie Carthen, on November 23rd of 1921 in Webb, Mississippi, Till Mobley's family left the South during the period when millions of Black Southerners moved en masse to the industrial North in what was called the Great Migration to escape racial violence and Jim Crow laws. 
1922, her father, Nash Carthen, went ahead to Argo, Illinois, near Chicago, where he found factory work. Alma Carthen joined her husband in 1924, bringing two-year-old Mamie and her brother John with her. They settled in a predominantly black and close-knit neighborhood in Argo. Sadly, in 1934, Mamie's parents divorced, an event that devastated her. To compensate, she threw herself into her schoolwork, becoming an A student, the first black person to make the honor roll and uh, the owner, the only, uh, uh, sorry, something just popped up on my screen. Uh, she was an A student, the first black person to make uh, the honor roll and the only, only the fourth black student to graduate from Argo Community High School. Again, a very brilliant woman. You're seeing that theme today, aren't you? All of these people today are just such brilliant people. There's no other word. Both academically and as people, right? Well, in 1940, Mamie married amateur boxer Louis Till. One year later, the couple gave birth to an only son, Emmett Till. By 1942, however, Mamie separated from Lewis because of domestic violence. The court, sympathetic to Mamie, gave Lewis two options, join the army or face jail time. Lewis chose the army. Well, three years later, in 1945, Mamie was told the news that Lewis had died in action in Italy, thus making her a single mom. Mamie didn't discover uh, the truth until 1955 during the trial about her son Emmett's death. What really happened was that Lewis had actually been court-martialed for rape and murder and hanged in Pisa, Italy in 1945. Well, desperate to provide Emmett a role model, a male role model, and a more stable home environment, Mamie married Pink Bradley in 1951. That marriage quickly fell apart, and by 1952, they were divorced. But again, always trying to do the right thing as a mom. In 1955, uh, Mamie sent uh, her son, uh, Emmett, uh, to Mississippi to spend the summer with cousins. Uh, being a young man from the North with some Northern attitudes, well, that didn't sit well with some. And he was murdered for supposedly speaking inappropriately to a white woman. His killers, Roy Bryant and J.W. Milne, were acquitted by an all-white jury, but actually admitted to the crime in a 1956 interview with Look Magazine. Well, people, of course, were outraged but because of double jeopardy laws, the two men couldn't be retried. Meanwhile, Till's mutilated body, which had been found decomposing in the Tallahatchie River, was returned to Chicago where his mother famously insisted on a public funeral service with an open coffin saying, I want the world to see what they did to my baby. Still difficult photographs to look at today, is it not? Now, I put some of these devastating images on your screen only to give you a sense of the horror and the disgust people within the Black community felt. After the funeral, Mamie began touring the nation, first for the NAACP and then privately to tell the story of her son's death and about race relations in America. Her third marriage in 1957 was to Gene Mobley, an old acquaintance, and the third time was indeed the charm. He proved to be a very supportive uh, husband, and they remained married until his death from a stroke in the year 2000. Three years after she got married in 1960, Mamie graduated from Chicago State University and officially changed her last name to Till Mobley, a hyphenated last name. She furthered her education and earned a master's degree in administration from Loyola University in 1975. From her graduation in 1960 until her retirement in the 1980s, Mamie was a productive teacher and administrator in the Chicago public schools. 
And it was as an educator that she created the Emmett Till Players in 1973 that toured schools around the country enacting key moments uh, from the uh, civil rights uh, era, such as speeches by MLK. Now you can keep up with the ongoing educational aspects of uh, the maybe Till Mobley Foundation on social platforms uh, like uh, Facebook. And I think you might be able to see this if I click on this. I hope you're seeing this on your screen, the maybe Till uh, Mamie Till Mobley Memorial Foundation. It's still there. You can go to their Facebook page and see all kinds of cool things. In fact, they just had something, they just posted something in January. So uh, please uh, take advantage of that. And by the way, these are the Emmett Till players. Uh, quite something. Well, as for Emmett's murderers in 1980, um, Milm, Milm and uh, Roy uh, Bryant, uh, 80 for Milman and 1992 for Bryant, they died unrepentant in Texas, rejected by most of their family, friends, and community. Even their own family couldn't stand them. <laughs> their respective deaths marked a frustrating end to one of the gravest episodes of the civil rights era and fueled Mamie Till Mobley even more to speak out about the death of her son. Indeed, from 1955 until 2000, Till Mobley was a constantly active, influential public speaker who remained deeply associated with the African-American media outlets. When she spoke, she often associated the death of her son with the life story of biblical characters, including Jesus of Nazareth, turning Emmett into a civil rights icon and martyr. It remains a powerful uh, story uh, that resonates with millions of people, both Black and non-Black. She said, when people saw what had happened to my son, men stood up who had never stood up before. And that's the truth. During the last years of her life, Mamie suffered from the effects of heart failure. And on January the 3rd of 2003, she died in Chicago. Fortunately, she had had time to complete her memoirs, and just a few months after her death, her autobiography, co-authored with Christopher Benson called Death of Innocence, was published. It's a beautiful and lasting testament to a brave woman. Um, there's also, as you probably know, a recent film titled Till, in which a Daniel a Deadweiler does a masterful job of portraying uh, while uh, 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 portraying Mamie, I should say. And finally, our sixth hero, Claudia Colvin. She's the only one of the heroes we're looking at who's still alive today. She's now 83 years old and living in Alabama, the epicenter of the movement. She was one of the litigants in a landmark Supreme Court case. And yet her story remains a frustratingly unknown one to many as we shall see. Claudette was born on September the 5th of 1939. Her parents, Mary Jane Gadson and C.P. Austin were not able to financially support Claudette. So she was adopted by Mary Ann and Q.P. Colvin, great aunt and uncle to her mother. Q.P. did yard work and Mary Ann was a domestic and not unlike the kind you see in a film like The Help. The pivotal episode of her youth happened in March of 1955. And remember that, March of 1955. Claudette, who was 15 years old, was pregnant by her then boyfriend. While returning home from Booker T. Washington High School on March the 2nd, a bus driver on her route ordered the pregnant girl to move from her seat to make room for a white lady. Well, something inside her at that moment kept her in her place. She refused, saying, this is my constitutional right. And for that, she got arrested. And there it is. This is my constitutional right. Well, the following month, April of 1955, Claudette was charged with disturbing the peace, violating Alabama segregation laws, and with assault. Now, remember. 
for a black person talking back to the white bus driver and resisting arrest were always considered assaults against authority. And in this case, an employee of the Transportation Bureau and a member of the police. Well, she was thrown into an adult jail, but got bailed out by her minister. Then in May of 1955, Claudette was found guilty in juvenile court, but the Montgomery Circuit Court dropped all but the assault charges. She ultimately served no jail time. Ah, but that's not the end of the story. We need to see how Claudette's experiences fits into the larger picture. So we need to remind ourselves of the now well-known December 1959 in incident, nine months after Claudette's experience, when Rosa Parks was also arrested for not giving up her seat. Ah, but here's the difference. Why do we know about her and not about Claudette? Well, Parks was older, she was 42 at the time. She already had a history of activism with her husband. She was not an unwed mother, and she was the secretary for the local branch of the NAACP. Parks was chosen to be the face of the cause for integration even though Claudette's experience was the much earlier case. Thus, it was Rosa's cause, not Claudette's, that inspired Martin Luther King to become a spokesperson for desegregation. Oh, and the plot thickens. In 1955, around the time of her arrest and release, Claudette and four other women who had also been victims of discrimination became the principles of Browder versus Gale, which challenged Montgomery's bus segregation. Aurelia Browder was one of the five women and was viewed as socially, quote unquote, respectable by the conservative black establishment. Hence, the case is known as Browder v. Gale and not Colvin v. Gale. The Gale in the lawsuit, by the way, was William Gale, who was the, uh, the mayor of Montgomery uh, from 51 to 1959. Now, in June of 1956, the U.S. District Court ruled that Montgomery's laws were unconstitutional. And then on November 13th of that same year, the U.S. Supreme Court affirmed the lower court decision effective on December 20th. And that decision, of course, put an end to the Montgomery bus boycott, which had been effective since December of 1955. Claudette's case became a landmark, yet she was hardly mentioned in the media, a footnote at best. Well, for two years after her, after her incident, Claudette was often branded a troublemaker because of her fierce passion for civil rights. And in 1958, she decided uh, that I've had enough, I'm dropping out of college. And in 1968, after the assassination of Dr. King, Colvin finally left the South for good and settled with her sister Velma in the Bronx, New York, where she worked as a nursing aide for decades. She raised the son that she had given birth to in Alabama, as well as another son born in New York. The first son, Raymond, died tragically of a heart attack in 1993. Uh, the other, uh, Randy, uh, is currently a successful accountant in Atlanta, Georgia. Today, Claudette proudly lists five grandchildren, a doctor, a nurse, an international businesswoman, and two military veterans. She has also welcomed five great-grandchildren into her family. Well, beginning in 2004, after she retired, Colvin and her family have continued to fight to have her importance recognized. They don't wish to take away from Rosa Parks. They just want Colvin to get recognition, especially for the importance of Browder v. Gale. Fortunately, many news outlets are now starting to publish her story and the city of Montgomery has given her several awards and recognitions, including in 2019, naming March 2nd, the day she was initially arrested, Claudette Colvin Day. The city has also renamed the street where the bus incident occurred. It's now Claudette Colvin Street. 
The real beginning, though, of the recognition took a, a leap in 2009 when Philip Hoos's biography uh, called Twice Towards Justice won numerous awards, including the National Book Award, the Newbery Honors Book, the Robert F. Siebert Award, the Jane Addams Children's Book Award, and the American Library Association's Best Book for Young Adults. Now, you think that would be it, but there's a curious postscript that I want to share with you. In September of 2016, the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture opened. And they didn't invite her to its opening and opted not to include anything about her in the exhibit that is devoted to the Montgomery bus boycott. Uh, there's also no mention of her on the museum's website yet. Well, let's see if that's changed since yesterday. Here is the museum's website. I hope you will be seeing it in a moment. Yes, there you go. And if I type in Claudette Colvin, okay, let's see if we get something. I, I would love this. I would love to see this in front of your eyes. Your search yielded no results. Sorry, folks, even the National Museum has nothing about her yet. I, I have hope. I have hope one day. So I wanted you to know about Claudette, mainly to continue to write what I see as a serious omission from American history. Of course, the truth is that there are untold dozens, probably more like hundreds, thousands of people like called, uh, Claudette Colvin. There are, trust me, who helped to change America for the better during the civil rights era and after. But the six stories that I've shared with you today, well, they're a start for you if you didn't know anything about them, right? They're, they're truly inspirational. They're stories that we need to hear. These six people, each in their own way, were courageous soldiers in the ongoing battle for equality. A battle that we continue to fight today. Yeah, sometimes uphill battle, but it's one that is worth fighting. Remember, uh, you can explore more at my website, uh, which is uh, makingwings.net. Uh, Again, it's that deeper dive number 46. And before I tell you about our program next month, this would be a great time to hear your thoughts and ideas. So thank you.